Hi everybody, it's Gary Lucas here on Saturday. And uh, what is it, January 9th now? It seems like an eternity this week uh, of time past. And I've spent most of it, like probably many of you, in lockdown, glued to the TV, watching the news. I can't believe it quite. I keep shuttling between CNN and MSNBC because I feel I'm getting a more accurate picture than on Fox News by a long shot. Though I, I do look at them from time to time just to see how they're covering the unfolding events. And it's so tragic and terrible. And, and I didn't even feel like playing today, uh, this morning. I just, you know. But I've roused myself and I think it's my sacred duty Anyway, to try and like cheer you guys up. I hope you're cheered up. Lulu is cheered up. Lulu is very, very talky today. What are you trying to say here? So here we go.
medley of, of this and that. And, uh, okay, well, I got your attention. Let me recommend this superb book that I just acquired, written by my friend Lena Friedrich, who is a French uh, lady who was based in New York. Uh, she goes back and forth from New York and Paris. And uh, she just got this published in English, and it was called The Neurotic Notebook. And it's really, it's great. It's funny. It's, it looks like the kind of a composition book. I know we have the backwards mirror image thing going on, so just uh, hold your camera up into a mirror, and you'll see this right side up, I guess. And uh, what this is, well, it looks like an exam book, you know, or, or a notebook. It's got blue line paper throughout, but very, very funny, uh, double, double meaning, not really double entendre, but typographical puns, let's say, uh, with various lines on each page. Okay, so here's one in the shadow. I'm the shadow of my former self, and it's kind of smeared on the page, so it's barely legible. All right. I was meant to rule not to be ruled, and of course it's unruly typography. So it's a meta humor book that comments on itself line by line, page by page. It kind of reminds me, in a way, of the great Mad Libs series that Roger Price did uh, in the mid-60s. All you oldsters may recall. All right. I thought I was bulletproof. That's really good, with a bullet hole in the page. Uh, I've lost my capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, and, of course, all in lowercase letters. So, so it goes. I'm having a mid-page crisis I don't want to spoil the fun, but it's supremely amusing. And uh, Lena, I can tell you, is a really uh, very talented, creative artist. She has a documentary that you may be able to view now on YouTube called The Hermit, that I composed a musical score for. And that centered around the discovery of a loner kind of... Uh, uh, guy who had retreated to the wilderness and become a recluse who occasionally would forage and raid camps in the Adirondacks for food, but then would go back to his place. He was harmless, but he was like a legendary Bigfoot type character. So eventually he got discovered and uh, there was a media circus around it. And she captured a lot of this in the ongoing hunt for this guy, the hermit. And you can also see Lead, uh, Lena in the in Inglorious Bastards, which is uh, one of a great many great films by Quentin Tarantino, and she's part of the French Jewish family holed up in the farmhouse. At the beginning of the movie, you'll see her right away, and uh, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed that movie. Although I have to say, as much as I like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I thought there was a bit of a reprise of the ending of Inglorious Bastards, if you know what I mean, uh, in the swimming pool sequence in, uh, up, at, uh, up at the house of, uh, of Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, anyway, why should I quibble? Uh, you know, the guy is quoting himself. And don't we also... Also, I wanted to point out, this is really a terrific gift. If you wanted to give a gift, gift. Besides Lena's book, I got this for Christmas, Hanukkah. The complete Jacques Tati on a Blu-ray disc. He only really made five films, six films, and some shorts, but they're all on here with copious annotations and extras and Easter eggs and all sorts of goodies on Blu-ray with a lot of original artwork. There's an even more deluxe version of this box, which unfolds into like a lunchbox. <laughs> They're very expensive. This is not that. All right. But like here's Monsieur Hulot's Holiday, and one of my favorite comedic masterpiece films. I never get tired of seeing it, and it's so good to see it so clearly, finally. Plus, if you do see the extras, they'll tell you a lot about the sound design in the film and you know the way uh, Tati brought it all together. He was quite a comedic genius and. Very sadly, he died in semi-obscurity and impoverished at the end, uh, basically 
after uh, some success with Mon Oncle, which is the first film I remember seeing a trailer for that in, must have been 1956, 57, in Syracuse. My Uncle, the rollicking adventure, I mean, it was translated in English. There was a version, but I didn't see it. I just saw the trailer. Anyway, the film that he did after that uh, is maybe considered his masterpiece, though it's a very, very dark film. And that would be, that would be, ah, uh, no, Playtime. He also has a film called Traffic, very good. Uh, but Playtime is sort of an Orwellian, uh, big brotherish, tense masterpiece. And some funny scenes, some laugh out loud scenes, particularly in the restaurant sequence of families trying to enter a restaurant that's still under construction uh, and the ensuing chaos the jazz playing and uh, but uh, there's a very dark melancholic side to this film and a good commentary on how Paris at the time and basically French culture as you remembered it was really threatening to disappear under the weight of modernist renovations uh, all over he was uh, definitely attracted to the to the Paris, especially of old, olden times, a lot of which has been torn up and disappeared, alas. So uh, I would recommend this box because they're all of them full of uh, f humor and, and, and a lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, he had a lot to say, Jacques Tati. And, I'm, and the, what bankrupted him actually, eventually, was the failure of that movie commercially insofar as he went and he built a kind of metaphorical city of tall buildings, many of which look like uh, they exist now currently on the periphery that surrounds Paris. But these buildings really didn't, go, they were movable on wheels. They were like gigantic set constructions and that cost a pretty penny. And uh, anyway, it's such is the case with a lot of the great artists, particularly film directors I could mention some of her friends of mine who can't get financing for their work currently because of the vagaries of the box office. So, you know, it's really, it's tough. It's tough to be an artist, particularly in the vanguard, uh, without patrons. God bless them. So, while I have your attention further, let's see.
<laughs> Wait, let's get the... Uh, let's get that Chinese steel guitar here. I want to thank the group Beijing Underground, Zhang San, who just inducted me as their 26,000th member into this Facebook user group of Chinese music freaks, of which I am one. And so this guitar, which I haven't pulled out in a while, is uh, made in Shanghai. It's a resonator from the Shanghai Resonator Rematch Company. And thanks to my cousin Max Green, who took me to the NAM show a couple of years ago in LA, in Anaheim. And Phil Mango, who scouted the joint out before I got there. We found this fantastic, uh, basically a little ghetto area of Chinese instrument manufacturers in the basement. They weren't really in the, in the, in the prime space in the exhibition hall, but they were thriving, and uh, I picked this one up because I like the look of it. And uh, I played for them, and they were impressed. And I said, listen, you know, I've made albums of Chinese music, and I would love to, to get one of these and endorse it for you. So they shipped me when it took a few months. But it finally came. <laughs> set this one up so it's playing correctly. Actually, the first song to appear on the very first Captain Beefheart album, Safe as Milk, entitled Sure Enough and Yes I Do, written by Don Van Vliet with Herb Berman, who was a lyricist poet living out uh, in the Mojave Desert, who was sort of in and out of Hollywood too, and Don hooked up with him for some of the early lyrics on the record. But I think some of them bear the trace of Don himself. And uh, I don't know, I've never did discuss this with him, uh, he didn't really answer when I asked him some questions about Herb, but Herb wrote a book, I think it's available through Beefheart.com, about his time in working with the Magic Band. And uh, That r r riff is probably on the album played by a young Ry Cooter, who was drafted to be in the Magic Band for a short time. Uh, I think he was 17 years old at the time, and his father used to drive him to the sessions in the day, or at night and then pick him up so he could go to school during the day and finish high school. But he was short-lived. There are many stories about, about that, which I won't go into. You should read Mike Barnes' book, just called Captain Beefheart, because it, it definitely distills some of the best ones. I've written uh, a little something down the timeline if you'd like to read about it, because a movie just came out called Grizzly 2, which was, gee, how many years in the making now? At least something... <laughs> 40 almost, I think it was, uh, 38 years perhaps, uh, we were approached, me acting in the capacity of the manager, of Don Van Vliet's manager, a role that was thrust upon me. Believe me, folks, 
it was not something I sought out for myself, but but did it basically as a labor of love for a while. Anyway, uh, they proposed that we, the band, appear in the sequel to the film Grizzly. I'd never seen it, I'd heard of it. And basically, uh, we were we were given this, this hustle to, uh, to want to be in it because they were going to film it in Budapest. It was supposed to be set in California, and there was a big sequence at a rock festival. And they built a giant mechanical bear as the monster, and they'd had some very top special effects technicians on this. And uh, in the scene that we were going to film, we were going to be on stage playing when the giant mechanical bear attacked the stadium where this rock concert was being held in Budapest to save money, right? Substituting for LA, I guess. And uh, so I said, well, uh, you know, let me run it by Don. But knowing him, I didn't hold that much hope. And then sure enough, when I told him what the proposal was, he said, tell them the only way I'm going to be in this is if he gets our former tour manager to fight the giant mechanical bear. I won't name any names here because uh, I like this guy. But anyway... Uh, Don had a set to during the last tour pretty much every day with our tour manager. And uh, he had famously had a punch out, punch up in Rotterdam, Holland, when this crazed fan attempted to barge past him. He was doing security on the door of our backstage area in what was, as I recall, a disused aircraft hangar. It was this gigantic cavernous space. It was freezing cold. They were trying to pipe in hot air <laughs> through pipes and hoses, you know, to warm up the punters. There were a lot of people there. But anyway, this guy was obviously off his rocker, kind of like those Trump supporters, uh, not to, you know, cast further aspersions on those fine, fine people. Uh, and he says, I, I must go and see the captain. And I... Our tour manager said, no, you're not, mate. He was like quite a, the banty rooster. And so the guy threw a swing at him and there was a punch up and then the guy tried to claw his face to get past him and it didn't end well for that guy. But anyway, only if the tour manager fought the giant mechanical bear was Don and Fleet going to do that festival. So it was a no-go. But now I, in reading The Guardian and, and also there was a review in The Times yesterday, I see that the film never really made it uh, into a release, or maybe there was a bootleg sporadic release for a minute before it was withdrawn, but it's finally limped out there with the, with the added extra traction as the top billed actors in it being George Clooney when he was 15 years old, Laura Dern, and I forget the other guy, but they're, they're offed by the giant mechanical bear within the first five minutes of the film. So I can't wait to see this, and uh, maybe we'll all get to see it soon enough, but until... Next time, I'm going to leave you uh, with uh, lots of hugs, big hugs. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. You know, I love to play for you. I'm, gee, I'm glad you talked me into it today uh, because uh, the news has been so grim. The only thing that I'm reminded of just in, in, in finishing is how prescient Roger Corman was uh, in two of the films that he's associated with in the 60s, you know, besides his fantastic science fiction and Edgar Allan Poe cycle of films, and my friend Tim Lucas will back me up on this, he also produced and directed one of these uh, two films, Wild in the Streets and then uh, The Wild Angels. The Wild in the Streets was this psychedelic fantasy of a utopia run by young people who turned out to be fascists in disguise and who incarcerate old people. And Richard Pryor is in it. It's quite good. It has an amazing bunch of songs, I think, by S Man and Wild. Uh, sh that Slade actually covered one of them. Nothing Can Stop the Shape of Things to Come. Very good film and prescient insofar as really depicting what's going on in many ways now. And then The Wild Angels, which was about the notorious Hells Angels, because didn't a lot of these people... I mean, there, there's a huge orgy of violence and a desecration of the church at the end of Wild Angels, of everything getting stomped, and they're, they're just... Oh, these angels are going berserk. But they look, a lot of them, like these characters. 
like these QAnon conspiracy theorists, like the guy with the horns and the furs. He could have been writing that film. So uh, food for thought. Anyway, check him out if you're looking for some, you know, mildly titillating entertainment. But uh, I think I'll go back to CNN right now. All right. It's not mildly titillating, though. It's disgusting. Uh, love you guys, and I'll see you on Tuesday, and have a wonderful weekend. Bye now.